Okay, so we have a mediation model here, and this is the first time we see this example, I think. So what we have here is high school dropout, a binary outcome variable. So if you have dropped out of high school or not, and we have as a mediator math 10, which you can think about as some kind of measurement of how well you, you can uh, attack or handle complicated courses like that, or complicated subject like that. And we have uh, a lot of covariates, but the one we're going to view as an exposure here is the math in the seventh grade. So uh, we have a mediation model here. And as I said, we had a binary outcome, but we also have uh, missing values on math 10 here, actually. We have some missing data here. And actually also on some of the covariates, actually. So we have missing data on the mediator and some of the covariates. All right, so how do we handle this model? Not a lot had changed. We just say that we have a high categorical outcome variable, as for usual now. But in the analysis command now, we're going to use the base estimator. So essentially, everything we have to do, like Ben said from the beginning, is to say estimator equals base. But to make it a bit faster, we could say processor equals two, to make each of these two chains run on, on one processor each. And then how many uh, Bayesian iterations we want to draw. In this case, we take 20,000 to really make sure. So we, so at least 20,000. So it will draw, make 20,000 iterations. And after 20,000 iterations, it will stop based on the potential scale reduction criterion. So we force it to make a lot first. And then, we, and then it stops on the criter uh, convergence criterion. And then in the model inward command, everything is uh, the same here. So we just uh, put our outcome variable. And now we don't have any moderation. So we have end and then math. Uh, 10, which is the mediator, and match 7, which is the exposure that we looked at. Uh, and we have to specify for what shift in the exposure that we want to see the effect. It's a continuous uh, exposure. But what about the missing data now? So if we look at this model, actually, we can allow for missing values on either high school dropout or math 10, because we have a bivariate outcome here, right? We have two outcomes. So in that case, when you have a bivariate outcome like this, you can have missing on one of them. If you are missing on, missing on both the outcomes, you, you will have, we have, will have to delete that individual. But if you, as long as you have missing on one of them, it's OK. They're both mentioned in the model here. Uh, but the missingness on the covariates are not handled here. So we will not handle this in this model. We'll, we'll get back to the exact same example in the, ba in the missing data section and handle that as well. So for now, we will list-wise delete the individuals that have missing on some of the covariates. So the missingness is implicitly handled for the mediator here, since we mentioned it. And we have a bivariate algorithm. And here is the uh, posterior distribution. So we have the indirect effect here. So we get a posterior distribution also for the indirect effect now. Uh, and you can see here that we have a non-symmetrical confidence interval a skew. Not that skew, but somewhat skew. And the mean estimate here is 0 0.01. And this is a probability, right? So if we go back to what we're looking at here, if the math 7 shifts one standard deviation, uh, then the probability of a high school dropout via the shift in math 10 due to the exposure shift is only around 1%. So it's on the probability scale there, right? And, and you can see that the mean and the median is pretty close to each other. All right, so if we compare them then, the ML estimates, if we would estimate this model with the maximum likelihood uh, model, they give almost identical uh, results. Identical in the sense that you would make the same conclusion. You, you would draw the same conclusions, but not identical in the case that we have a numerical procedure. So we will not get the exact same, obviously. But in this case, maximum likelihood needs Monte Carlo integration with 250 points, because the mediator is partially latent now, right? Uh, the mediator is not absurd for everyone. Uh, so we would also need to have bootstrap for the maximum likelihood framework, as we said, to capture this skewness of the sampling distribution and the indirect effect, and also to get the non-symmetrical confidence interval. So the maximum likelihood would take 21 minutes here, whereas the base would take 21 seconds. So it's a pretty large difference, even for this example. It's not that heavy. And also, not only is the time difference large here, we, we base the ML skew distribution on 1,000 draws, whereas the uh, Bayesian posterior is based on 20,000 draws. So we have a lot better precision in the higher and the low, low percentiles of this distribution. So the confidence interval is probably more accurate for the base here, assuming that we have independent draws. The autocorrelation is low between each draw. 
All right, but that is only one of the neat things about base that it goes really fast and you get the skewed distribution and the non-symmetrical confidence interval right away. The second part is that you can include previous knowledge. So we're going to look at this example now. It's a mediation model with uh, only continuous variables except the treatment variable which is exposure to a randomized experiment. It's an intervention and the intervention in this case is information about eating healthy, how, how good it is for you to eat fruit and stuff like that. And the mediator is a changing knowledge of the benefits of healthy eating. So how much more you have learned about how good it is for you to eat healthy. And finally, the outcome is reported, eat, uh, reported healthy eating. So can the information change your knowledge is one question. And the other question is, can the information change your behavior? You can think about cigarettes. Every no everyone knows that it's bad to smoke. But some people still do it. So changing the knowledge and changing the behavior is not the same thing. Is that self-reported healthy eating or other reported healthy eating? Self-reported. Self-reported Yes. Okay. Uh, but now it turns out that it's been a previous study on this. So actually, uh, there's a study showing that the slope of the mediator, change in knowledge, regressed on the treat this intervention has a distribution, a sampling distribution with the normal distribution of, with a mean of 0 0.35 and a variance of 0 0.04. And we also have results on where it comes to the reported healthy eating regressed on the mediator, I call it B here, that it has a normal distribution, the sampling distribution, with a mean of 0 0.1 and a variance of 0 0.01. And actually, that's not really true, because this vari we have increased this variance four times, larger than what we observed in this previous study. And when you think about the variance of the priors, you can kind of think about them as weights. So if you increase the variance for a prior, you will give the prior information less weight as compared to the likelihood and the data that we have collected for, for this study. And I would say that it's always OK to increase the variance. That would only make the weight of the prior less. So you could, you could do that arbitrarily, like four times here. That would only say that I, I don't want to over, over trust the previous results here. So that's OK. I'm just including less previous information. However, if I would make it smaller, then I would kind of mess, mess it up in another way. That would be a lot worse in the sense of making the results being what I want or being accused for stuff like that. Uh, so with a smaller sample also, the prior has a larger effect. So you have kind of the weight of the data is the sample size. If you have a very large sample size, it won't matter what prior you have. The data will overrule that. And if you have a small variance of the prior, it will have a larger weight. So you can kind of look at them as the two different weights, the sample size of the, of the data you have now and the variance of the prior. Uh, so how do you specify this then? You put up your model as usual. You have to use the Bayesian model, of course, because if you want to include priors, that's part of the Bayesian framework. And what you do is that you give labels to the parameters that you want to have informative priors on. So every parameter in the model has uninformative priors or non-informative priors as a default. But if you want to override that and add an informative prior, we just add a label. So we say that Y regressed on M should have the label B, and M regressed on X should have the label A. So this is reported healthy eating regressed on change in information, and this is uh, change in information regressed on the treatment. And then we add the model priors command. So this tilde should be read out as follows. So a priori, A follows a normal distribution with the mean 0 0.35 and the variance 0 0.04. And a priori, B, which is this slope, Y regressed on the mediator, follows a normal distribution with 0 0.1 and variance 0 0.01. And this does not, of course, not have to be normal. You can specify either other distributions here. So you can look in the user's guide what kind of distributions you can specify here and for, for different, which one is suitable for different parameters. Uh, and that's, that's it. That's everything you need to do, really. And I don't think we will look at the results for this. But uh, what, I, well, what I can tell you is that if you have some prior knowledge, that is actually prior knowledge, not something that you just arbitrarily made up, but like a previous study, you can increase the precision a lot. So this is something that I use, uh, try to use as much as I can if I have pre pre previous knowledge. And do you have anything to add? Otherwise, it's time for the last section, missing data. All right. Fun. Yeah.